A trope is defined as a commonly used storytelling device, and when it comes to fantasy novels, there are some tropes that just seem to work every single time I read them. And this is because tropes have a psychological effect. Stories are fundamentally about the exploration of patterns. The storytelling pattern of a young character discovering that they have this magical ability and then setting off on an adventure to conquish a dangerous foe and grow in their own maturity and understanding of the world. That is a pattern that applies to everything from Harry Potter to Star Wars to Lord of the Rings to a thousand other stories out there from Greek myth through to modern movies. And it is the enjoyable exploration of these mythic structures and patterns that are embedded into our subconscious and psyche as humans that make for interesting stories. And tropes are your pathway into that as a fantasy writer. Of course, tropes are execution dependent. If you do a trope badly, it feels like a cliche. But I think there are some fantasy tropes that have a much higher likelihood of success than others. So in this video, I'll be sharing seven of my favorite fantasy tropes to give you inspiration when it comes to writing your fantasy novel. And I'll also unpack the psychology behind why each of these tropes is effective and also any potential pitfalls you need to watch out for when deploying them in your story. And the first trope is character campfire building. So to illustrate why this is such an effective and emotionally evocative trope, I need to tell you a quick story about the time when I did the Sterling Range Bridge Walk. This was a grueling two day hike. So grueling in fact, that one of the guys I did it with had actually climbed the base camp of Mount Everest. And he said that even though this hike was much shorter, it was way tougher. And basically after a whole day of hiking through miserable rain, going up these slopes, almost falling off this slippery mountain. We finally come to a cave and we build this campfire. And around that campfire, we're able to finally relax after 12 hours of hiking. And we tell stories, we laugh with each other, we tell jokes about the stupid stuff that we got up to that day. We sing songs and there's just this tremendous sense of camaraderie that is forged in that moment. You've gone through such a difficult physical experience beforehand and now you finally have this moment to relax, to appreciate each other's company, to feel a sense of accomplishment. And even though this hike only lasted for two days, and even though I only went into this hike knowing two people from the group that we actually went on the climb with, by the end of that hike, I felt so incredibly bonded to all of these people. And it was because of this experience, I think, this experience of sitting in this cave with the fire going and just bonding with each other after such a hard day's work. And this is a trope that I absolutely love reading in fantasy stories. You probably recognize this scene from some of your favorite fantasy books or movies out there. The characters, after a bunch of action, maybe after kind of fleeing across country from the foe that is pursuing them, they finally have a moment to sit around the campfire and joke and tell stories, maybe share old war wounds or old scars, maybe even do a little bit of training or perhaps even discuss the antagonist that they are fighting against. And it's in this really kind of moment of quietness where the stakes are suddenly lowered, it feels like you can relax, you can breathe, that there is just this emotional connection that you forge as a reader with characters in this moment. Sometimes the temptation as a new fantasy writer is to think that you need to keep suspense and tension high all the time. And that is a big mistake. Yes, you absolutely need moments of high tension, but the way you wanna think about it is you wanna oscillate the tension and suspense in your story. So you wanna go from you know, no tension to high tension to low tension to high tension. And you kind of want to like zigzag and oscillate this thing throughout the course of your story. Because the same level of tension over and over again is just boring and repetitive and it wears out the reader. So using these sort of character campfire moments as a way to build character and to strengthen the bond between the reader and the people in your story is a really effective trope. The second fantasy trope that I really like is what I call the wistful gaze for adventure. The classic example here is Luke Skywalker standing on his parents' farm on Tatooine and staring out at the binary sunset, longing for adventure. And I think these moments here, when the start of your story, where you can show a character that feels a little bit trapped within their life, just wishing for this wanderlust, this experience of transcendence, this experience of growth and adventure and newness and novelty, it's so powerful because one of the big reasons why we come to fantasy stories is that sense of wonder and adventure and newness and aliveness that comes from seeing somebody jump out of their ordinary world and venture into this extraordinary world of magic and armies and demons and 
these grand epic scale conflicts and all of these other things that come along with the fantasy genre. And in particular, I think this moment, this sort of wistful gaze, this sort of longing for adventure trope that often occurs at the beginning of fantasy stories is really effective for generating sympathy and connection between the reader and the main character because we've all had moments like that in our lives. And it means that when they finally receive their call to adventure, when they have their Obi-Wan coming along to summon them on a quest or their Gandalf coming in to drag them off onto the fellowship, it just makes that more meaningful and impactful. And as a reader, you'll be like so invested in them at that point. And I should mention that with this idea of the wistful gaze, the wistful longing for adventure, it doesn't literally have to be a gaze. It can be any sort of moment that shows this character wants something more from their life than what they're having. And this goes for all of these tropes through here. So always think about these tropes in terms of the metaphorical impact and the emotional impact they're producing with readers. Trope number three is the corrupting magic item. So here we're getting to the good stuff. Magic is a key reason why I love fantasy and it's probably why you enjoy writing fantasy as well. The thing with magic though is sometimes it can feel overpowered. It can feel like it's just too easy to solve problems with the magic because there's no consequences or no stakes. And this is why corrupting magic items are so compelling and interesting. So the classic example here is the one ring from Lord of the Rings. Putting this ring on gives you the ability to become invisible, an extremely useful and cool ability. However, it slowly corrupts your soul and if you leave it on too long, you become like Gollum. The reason why this trope is so cool from a storytelling perspective is that it adds a real sense of stakes and consequences every time the character uses the magic. As I said before, if you just have magic where there is no price to pay, it can feel a little bit too easy and it can just feel like it's meaningless every time it's used to solve a problem. But if you know that every time the character picks up this cursed sword, yes, they might be able to defeat their enemies and escape the situation they're in, but more and more of their soul might become corrupted by this thing. And this is actually a trope that I explored quite a lot in Kingdom of Dragons, which I'm editing the third draft at the moment. It's getting really close to being done. The cover art is almost finished as well, which is super exciting. But I kind of brought this trope into the story in a big way with my Sun Warden characters. This is sort of an order of warrior magicians who have these swords that are made from molten sunlight. And along with being able to summon these sun blades, they also have other powers, like the ability to shoot these beams of sunlight from their eyes that can cut through people and burn down buildings. They can also summon illusions from light that can fool people. And they can also teleport by turning into a beam of light and transporting across space. But every time they use these powers, they deplete a little bit more of their essence. And the only way to slow down that depletion is to drink this elixir. However, if you use too much of your essence up and eventually every sun warden gets to this point where they have used too much of their essence up, they will break and they will become a dark warden instead. And these dark wardens are way more powerful than a regular sun warden, but they also extremely mad and they wreck destruction wherever they go. So you can see here by applying this trope of a magical item or a magical ability that corrupts, it leads to a lot of stakes because now every time you see a Sun Warden character using their powers, you realize that there's a cost. You realize that they are choosing to shorten their life and there are real consequences for having to use the magic in this situation. And in fact, that also leads to other interesting aspects with the world building. So in this world, Sun Wardens have an apprentice and the idea here is that when a Sun Warden feels like they're getting close to shattering the Eclipse, which is what it's called when you deplete your essence and become a Dark Warden, they will actually have their apprentice ritually execute them and then with the execution of them, their Sun Blade passes to the apprentice and that apprentice now becomes a Sun Warden in their own right. And then from a psychological perspective, what makes this trope so compelling for readers is that there are always these things in our lives that produce short-term pleasure but long-term pain. All of these tropes, they are effective because they tap into something within human nature and they extrapolate that to form interesting stories and interesting conflicts and tensions that you can explore in your narrative. Trope number four is magical loopholes. So, big fan of magic systems as you can probably tell from my massive rant about corrupting magic items just then. A magical loophole is essentially where you set up this hard magic system with defined rules about how your magic operates. What is required to fuel it, the restrictions around it, the limitations, the things it can do, the things it can't do. You basically set up these rules around it and then you have this twist moment where there is an intersection of these rules that readers probably didn't see coming, but makes total sense in hindsight. And it allows your characters to get out of a story problem or to resolve in particular the climax of your narrative or they resolve a key struggle. Now, what makes this so psychologically interesting in a story is that if you do it right, if you set up the rules and you stick to them throughout the story, but then you find this loophole that readers weren't expecting, 
It is by far one of the most effective ways to create a twist ending in your fantasy story that doesn't feel like you're cheating. It's a way to get characters out of jail without feeling like you just brought in the hand of God and plucked them out. But this whole idea of setting up this magic system in such a way that you can pull this twist out at the very end is the whole reason why I wrote Fires of the Dead. This is the first novella I published, it's really short. And the whole idea behind this came to me when I realized that I had this idea for this fire-based magic system that was a bit different to the other things I'd read out there. And it allowed for this very interesting intersection of rules in a way that meant you could have a not very powerful character manage to defeat the main antagonist of the story in a way that you probably didn't see coming. I don't wanna spoil it, but if you've read it, you probably know what I'm talking about here. Now, a key consideration with this trope is that you need to make sure that you don't cheat. You really need to make sure that you're not obscuring information from the reader in a way that makes them feel like you have been unfair to them in this twist. The degree to which you can have these magical loopholes that solve story problems is often related to the degree with which your reader understands the magic system and the degree to which there are clear rules, limitations, and restrictions around it. A magical loophole probably won't feel very satisfying if it's this soft magic system that you don't really understand how it works. And then at the very end, you've got this wizard carrier that just snaps their fingers and destroys the enemy army that's attacking. And they haven't used this power at any other stage in the story and it's just come out of the blue. That's not gonna feel very good as a reader. While we're on the topic of magic systems, if you don't already know, I'm actually running a $1,000 magic system contest where you can submit your magic system ideas and I'll be picking one winner to receive a $1,000 prize. Although I'm actually in talks with sponsors right now to potentially increase that prize amount. So fingers crossed. We've already had around about 200 entrants, which is blown my mind because I only put out the application form about five days ago, but the applications will remain open until the 20th of July. So the link to the video where I describe all of this is down in the description below or up here if you haven't already checked it out. Trope number five is the mentor's death. Oftentimes in fantasy stories, a key catalyst for the main character's growth is a mentor figure. Again, to use Lord of the Rings as an example here, Gandalf leading Frodo out of the Shire and taking him to meet up with the Fellowship, that is a mentor figure within a fantasy story. Gandalf is this powerful wizard, he offers guidance, and he is this force of protection and learning throughout the story. However, there is of course a moment where Gandalf sacrifices his life in order to save the Fellowship from the Balrog, and he appears to die. The death of a mentor typically occurs right at the end of the second act and the start of act three. So in percentage terms, this is usually around 75% of the way through a novel. And the reason why it's so effective is that the mentor figure offers a tremendous degree of protection for the main character. They are the wise old sage, they know the ways of the world, and they're able to help the character through their conflicts. However, when you remove the mentor figure and you make them die, all of a sudden the stakes go up because now there's no one to protect the main character. Now they're all on their own. There's a few different ways you can play the death of a mentor. One way which I find particularly interesting is you have the mentor die as a result of a mistake or a moral failing that the main character has made. So let's say your characters are going on some sort of stealth mission and the main character arrogantly decides to try to steal this jewel that wasn't part of this mission. And as a result of that, the guards come and the mentor has to sacrifice themselves so that the main character can flee. In that case, it's the main character's hubris which has led to the mentor's death. And they're gonna feel a tremendous amount of guilt from this, which will hopefully prompt them to experience change within their character arc. Another effective way to kill off your mentor figure is to have them vanquished by the primary antagonist. When you do this, it really ups the stakes and it establishes the true power and menace of the antagonist in your fantasy story. And as I mentioned earlier in this video, you don't always have to have the mentor literally die for this trope to be executed. You could simply have the mentor be forced to go on an absence or they leave the main character for some reason or they journey away. This is something that happens quite a lot in the Harry Potter books. Dumbledore serves as this mentor figure but oftentimes when it comes to the final conflict, he is missing or out of action or he's pulled away or distracted. And even though he hasn't literally died in those circumstances, it serves the same narrative function of forcing the main character to deal with their problems all by themselves. Trope number six is enemies forced together in peace. This occurs when you have a scene in your story that brings your protagonist and antagonist together in a confined location without the ability to actually fight each other or to battle. And of course, even though I'm just talking about protagonists and antagonists, you can have multiple characters all coming together 
in this case. What I really like about this trope and what makes this very psychologically effective is you are bringing characters together who really want to fight each other, but they can't. And therefore the way they have to do battle against each other is usually purely through dialogue and kind of mental dueling. Joe Abercrombie does this brilliantly in his Age of Madness trilogy. There is one very pivotal scene where pretty much every point of view character is jammed together into this gathering. And obviously at this gathering, they can't be fighting each other with their swords. So they have to be fighting each other with their words. And it's a really nice way to vary the conflict in your story. Rather than having every scene be this big physical battle, having scenes like this where it's more of a mental or an emotional or even a spiritual battle, can be really compelling and interesting. And it's also just a great opportunity to better understand where each character is coming from, to understand what is motivating these antagonists, what they're trying to do. And when you have these moments where it's just like a dozen characters, you know, all spread out in this ballroom situation or this party, the fact that you just have all these different lines of character relationships and this character web is all confined into this one building is so compelling and so interesting to me and offers up a ton of narrative possibility. And then the seventh and final fantasy trope I'm gonna discuss in this video is the astral plane. You can think of this kind of as a secondary dimension that your characters can step into and it will often allow them to travel large distances within their story or to commune with spirits. And it basically is just this sort of like parallel dimension where it's almost kind of psychedelic and dreamlike and it just feels like this other worldly aspect to it. A great example here is the Shade Smart in the Stormlight Archive. This is this parallel world where when you step into it, the solid land in the regular world becomes these beads that form this sort of ocean-like surface within Shadesma. And by contrast, the ocean surfaces in the regular world become solid rocky ground in Shadesma. And within this world, magical abilities are transformed in a slightly different way and characters can use it in order to travel between places without being detected in the regular world. And I really like these concepts of these astral planes within fantasy stories because it just opens up all these interesting possibilities and it feels like you are able to access this sort of transcendent spiritual quality to it. Like I've said before, one of the big reasons we come to fantasy is for this sense of wonder, this sense of exploration. And there's nothing that quite gets that, like this parallel world which the characters discover and they step into and they realize that the universe that they have explored is far bigger than they think it is. Oftentimes this trope is particularly psychologically effective because within this astral plane, there are answers to many of the mysteries of a fantasy world. And it gives you this opportunity to construct a different fantasy setting with its own unique set of rules and potential conflicts and tension. So those are seven fantasy tropes that I personally really enjoy. I'd love to know some of your favorite tropes in the comments down below. And when you've done that, you might enjoy this video. Cheers, and I'll see you in the next video.